CE designate John Lee and his governing team meet the press. More than 1,200 COVID-19 cases in Hong Kong, with another three elderly care homes reporting infections. And 21 COVID cases in Macau, ending the enclave's 251-day streak of no infections. Good evening and welcome to TVB News. Beijing has formally approved the list of principal officials submitted by Chief Executive Designate John Lee for the sixth term government of the Hong Kong SAR. Lee introduced his team to the public this afternoon. Caleb Lung begins our coverage. Chief Executive Designate John Lee today unveiled the lineup of top officials who will join him in the sixth term government of the Hong Kong SAR. <laughs> I wish to express my heartfelt gratitude to the CPG for accepting and approving the nomination made by me in accordance with the basic law. I would also like to thank the CPG for the trust in and support for me and my governing team. Eric Chen Kwoki, currently director of the chief executive's office, will become chief secretary for administration. Chair Quing Hing, former director of the Dialogue Office, will serve as Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration. Paul Chen will remain as Financial Secretary, while Michael Wong, the current Secretary for Development, will become Chen's deputy. Paul M. and Ho Cheng Kuo Kwan will assume the roles of Secretary for Justice and Deputy Secretary for Justice, respectively. With the government to be restructured on July 1st, the Chief Secretary for Administration will be supervising nine bureaus. Eric Zheng and Chris Tang will retain their posts as Secretary for Constitutional and Mainland Affairs and Secretary for Security, respectively. Current Secretary for Education Kevin Yuan will take the newly created post of Secretary for Culture, Sports and Tourism, while his current post will be assumed by Under Secretary for Education Choi Yuk Lin. Under Secretary for the Environment Tse Chin Wan will become Secretary for Environment and Ecology. Chief Executive of the HKU Shenzhen Hospital, Professor Lo Chong Mao, is set to take the post of Secretary for Health. Commissioner for Labor Chris Sun will assume the Office of Secretary for Labor and Welfare, while Permanent Secretary for the Civil Service Ingrid Young will become the new Secretary for the Civil Service. Alice Mack, a lawmaker from the Federation of Trade Unions, is set to assume the role of Secretary for Home and Youth Affairs. As for his six bureaus supervised by the financial secretary, Christopher Hoy will retain his role as secretary for financial services and the treasury. Director of architectural services Winnie Ho will assume the office of secretary for housing. Former permanent secretary for development Lam Sai Hong will return to the government as secretary for transport and logistics. Permanent secretary for development Bernadette Lin will be the new secretary for development. The Office of Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development will be assumed by Algernon Yao. Yao is the CEO of Greater Bay Airlines and former CEO of Cathay Dragon. Sun Dong is said to become the City Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry. In addition, Johnny also appointed Carol Yip as the Director of the Chief Executive's Office. Caleb Leung, TVB News. Both the new Chief Secretary for Administration Eric Chan and his deputy Chuck Wing Hing started their career in disciplinary services. Timothy Lee has details. Eric Chan will be the new number two figure in the sixth term Hong Kong SAR government. He said he understands he is shouldering a lot of responsibilities, ranging from fighting the pandemic to livelihood issues. Chan said he will request government departments to streamline procedures and improve efficiency in order to solve the public's problems. He added he will implement the one country, two systems principle to bring better lives to Hong Kong people. Chan started his career in government in 1982 when he joined the immigration department as an assistant immigration officer after graduating from Xu Yan College. One of his duties was handling the rush when many people applied to get a British passport before the handover. 
applicants are required to pay the fee of 2,400. If their spouse is a, a British dependent territory citizen, then the fee is 840. Chan was later transferred to the city's office in Beijing, from where he built a strong network. He succeeded Simon Pei and became director of immigration in 2011. And he had to deal with matters such as the parallel traders issue and pregnant mainland women giving birth in Hong Kong. After retiring in 2016, Chan became the head of chief executive Carrie Lam's office. I deeply believe that under Mrs. Lam's leadership, Hong Kong will have a better future. So I'm very happy to be a, a member of her team. Chan was later appointed the Secretary General of the Committee for Safeguarding National Security for the HKSAR. The new Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration, Chuck Wing Heng, started his government career as a police officer after graduating from the University of Hong Kong before becoming an administrative officer three years later. He had worked in many departments and bureaus, including serving as Commissioner for Labor when he handled issues such as industrial actions. He was the permanent secretary at the Innovation Technology Bureau when he retired in 2019. During the social unrest related to the anti-extradition bill movement, Chirk returned to government and worked as the head of the Dialogue Office. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Incoming Secretary for Justice Paul Lam said he will safeguard Hong Kong's rule of law. The 54-year-old also promised a clear division of labor between himself and his deputy, Horace Jones. All eyes are on the next Secretary for Justice. Getting the job of the government's top legal officer is the 54-year-old Paul Lam, who said he will do everything he could to garner trust and support from the public. As someone who is passionate about Hong Kong and committed to Hong Kong, I would definitely safeguard the rule of law. I want to make the people of Hong Kong feel that Hong Kong is uh, worth is image and feel proud of Hong Kong. Before joining the government, Lam was a senior counsel. Since 2015, he sat as a deputy judge of the High Court of Hong Kong for short periods each year. In 2017, Lam succeeded Winnie Tam to become chairman of the Hong Kong Bar Association. During his tenure, he questioned the legal basis of the co-location arrangement for the high-speed rail link. No one is above the law. And even if uh, one is the highest organ uh, in a country. Uh, it's still necessary for that highest organ to exercise its power in accordance with the law. Since 2019, Lam has been appointed to several public service positions, including a member of the Independent Police Complaints Council and a chairman of the Consumer Council. Taking up a new position in the government, the Deputy Secretary for Justice is Horace Zheng. Zheng joined the Democratic Alliance for the Betterment of Hong Kong in 2002 and became vice president in 2009. In 2011, he won a district council election and became a lawmaker five years later. Zheng was appointed an executive council member the following year. Speaking to the public in a different role today, he explained how his job duties will differ from Paul Lam in future. I will also liaise with stakeholders and explain our policies to the general public. Chang is one of the lawmakers appointed to take up positions within John Lee's cabinet. Meanwhile, some other incoming bureau chiefs also have non-government backgrounds. Jackie Lin with details. Hong Kong have a lot of talents. We can gather as much as possible experiences, angles and strengths from different sectors. As Chief Executive Designate John Lee spotlighted the diverse makeup of his governing team, six newly minted principal officials were invited from outside the civil service. They include the Chief Executive of the University of Hong Kong Shenzhen Hospital, Professor Lo Chong Mao, who's poised to helm the Health Bureau. Dr. Lo says anti-epidemic efforts will remain front and center when he takes office. When asked if he will push for a mass testing campaign, he said exercises of this kind might be good for the mainland, but more scrutiny will be needed in Hong Kong. As to what policies can be applied to Hong Kong, we need to look at data as well as coordination with different departments. 
Also appointed from outside the civil service is Elginan Yao, CEO of Greater Bay Airlines. He's named to be the next Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. Also, a quartet of current lawmakers, including Alice Mack, who has resigned from the Legislative Council and the Federation of Trade Unions. She will serve as a Home and Youth Affairs Chief. Youth matters. So you, we will uh, focus on youth work, and I will work closely with, with all sectors in the society and community to um, develop uh, youth policies that we can, that uh, uh, our young people can see hope and opportunities. Mainland-born lawmaker Sun Dong, meanwhile, will be the Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry. The scientist-turned-politician arrived in Hong Kong in 2000 before being elected to the legislature last December. Jacqueline TV News. The State Council's Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office issued a statement congratulating the appointments of the incoming government officials. The office expects the new team to fully implement the one country, two systems principle correctly and make more progress in fixing the issues of concern to Hong Kong residents. Beijing's liaison office in Hong Kong also issued a statement noting that the new team has a global perspective and good management ability. Chief Executive Carrie Lam said, under the leadership of the chief executive, the new governing team will strive to resolve economic and livelihood issues with perseverance and dedication. Speaking on a TVB program, Chief Executive Carrie Lam said she was partly responsible for what happened during the 2019 anti-extradition unrest. She also talked about her COVID-19 policies. Timothy Lee has the story. Commenting on the unrest during the anti-extradition bill movement, Lam recently said officials in charge at the time had not adequately explained the issues to the public. She said her words have been taken out of context, and she ultimately bore the responsibility. The CE said the situation did not solely revolve around the amendment bill, noting that a strong anti-Beijing sentiment existed in the city. When asked about why the bill was not withdrawn earlier, Lam said she does not believe making concessions would have avoided conflict. She said it was only a matter of time that anti-Beijing sentiments would escalate explosively. Lam said she had talked to the police directly during the unrest, which helped reduce casualties among both the protesters and law enforcement officers. Carrie Lam also commented on the COVID pandemic. She emphasized the difficulty for the healthcare system to suddenly handle tens of thousands of infected patients per day. She said the low vaccination rate among the elderly led to serious conditions among these patients. The CE added that if she had more time left in office, she would have strived harder for quarantine-free travel with the mainland, acknowledging the negative effects it has on the city's economy. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Hong Kong reported 1,276 new COVID cases today, the fifth consecutive day when the daily caseload exceeded 1,000. Among the new infections, 115 are imported cases. Another three elderly care homes reported infections, while three previously affected homes each saw a new case. The police reported another infection within their ranks, amounting to 23 people in total. The Centre for Health Protection believes the transmission was caused by the lack of mask wearing during training and officers eating together in police vehicles with their masks off. The city saw another 13 suspected cases involving the BA. 2.1 mutant strain. Meanwhile, two COVID patients died yesterday, including a 52-year-old male who had been triple vaccinated. Macau ended its 251-day streak of no COVID cases as the enclave reported 21 new infections today. From tomorrow to the day after, all government services will be suspended. Starting today, all classes are suspended until further notice and a city-wide PCR test began at noon. Around 100 people were seen lining up for their COVID tests before midday. As of 4 p.m., 97,000 people were tested, with 5,406 confirmed as negative. Macau has 53 testing centres. Officials said they will not exclude seeking help from the central government if case numbers rise. Those leaving Macau must carry a negative PCR test result within 24 hours, while those entering the city via the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge must provide a negative PCR result issued within 48 hours. Still to come on tonight's news, fierce fighting continues in eastern Ukraine, with Russia said to be sending in reserve troops. 
In the U.S., Joe Biden falls off his bike while cycling in Delaware. And the CDC recommends COVID-19 vaccines for children as young as six months. Welcome back to TVB News. A regional governor of Ukraine says Russia is sending reserve troops to Severodonetsk in a bid to try and gain full control of the frontline eastern city. And the Russians are making another push on Kharkiv in the north, with the situation being described as difficult by the Ukraine Interior Ministry. This as the NATO chief, Jens Stoltenberg, gave a gloomy assessment of the situation in Ukraine, saying the war could go on for years. Matthew Bray reports. U.S. delivered howitzers firing on Russian positions in the eastern Donbass, but by all accounts, the Ukrainians are having a torrid time holding on to territory even with Western hardware reaching the front line. Heavy smoke can be seen in districts of Donetsk, although Ukraine routinely denies carrying out such shelling. Russian television showed the results, with the separatist authorities saying residents were staying in shelters as their homes got bombarded. Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky made an unannounced visit to the south, touring Odessa and Mykolaiv. Here he saw a damaged building undergoing reconstruction and spent time with the National Guard. He also visited a hospital meeting patients and doctors. I want you to know that nobody forgets about you. We are proud to have doctors like you in our country, said Zelensky. He was also in Mykolaiv, another city on the Black Sea coast, where two people were killed in shelling yesterday. He went on to the site of the regional administration building, which was shelled in April by Russia, killing 37 people. Zelensky was also seen in what appeared to be an underground bunker, handing out medals to the regional administration military leader Vitaly Kim. In another development, two top commanders who defended the Azov-style steel plant in Mariupol have apparently been transferred to Russia for investigation. This according to Russian state news agency TASS. Uncertainty has surrounded the fate of hundreds of fighters who were captured by Russia in May after a months-long siege of the port city. Some Russian lawmakers want them put on trial. In Kyiv, hundreds of mourners gathered for the funeral of Roman Ratushny a 24-year-old activist who took up arms against Russia following the invasion. He was killed near the town of Izium on the Eastern Front. Ratushny had come to prominence as a 16-year-old during the Maidan protests that toppled pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych in 2014. Heroes never die, said some of the mourners. Matthew Bray, TVB News. U.S. President Joe Biden fell when attempting to dismount his bike at the end of a ride near his beach home in Delaware. Biden, who avoided serious injury after the tumble, is spending a long weekend in the state with his wife following their 45th wedding anniversary on Friday. The president also hinted that he may be close to making a decision on whether to lift certain American tariffs on Chinese goods. Daniel Rao tells us more. U.S. President Joe Biden fell as he went to get off his bike to greet people who had gathered to see him at the end of a Saturday ride at Cape Henlopen State Park near his beach home in Delaware. He was quickly helped up by U.S. Secret Service agents before composing himself and talking to the crowd. After the tumble, Biden told reporters that he was good and that he had got his foot caught in the bike's toe cages. A White House statement later said the president did not require medical attention and is fine. Later on Saturday, Biden attended mass at a local Catholic church. When he appeared after the service, bystanders cheered and reporters asked questions about how he felt after the accident. The president responded jovially. He smiled and hopped three times, making a gesture with his hands that appeared to simulate jumping rope. Biden has had some previous high-profile stumbles, including tripping multiple times as he was boarding Air Force One amid windy conditions last December. In late 2020, he also incurred hairline fractures in his foot after slipping while playing with his dog. Still, after recovering from his fall on Saturday, Biden said he is planning to hold talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping and mulling whether to lift certain U.S. tariffs on Chinese goods. Yes, now I'm going to be talking to him. How soon will the president I will be. How's the anniversary? Thank you. How soon are you talking to, to Xi? I ain't telling you. Have you made up your mind on China tariffs, sir? Uh, we're in the process of doing that. You're, you're, you're lifting the tariffs? I, we're in the process of making up my mind. 
Biden's comments come with U.S. national security and economic aides compiling a review of Washington's tariff policy. Daniel Rowell, TVB News. The United States has paved the way for children as young as six months to receive COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention has approved the measure and the shots will become available next week. Nasbi Karim has details. Around 18 million children aged six months to five years old can now be vaccinated against COVID-19 in a move that has divided the U.S. medical community. Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, using the same technology as adult jabs, were unanimously approved by the 12-member CDC panel, which met online. Moderna requires two jabs, four weeks apart, each at a quarter of its adult dose. The Pfizer program, one-tenth of an adult shot, comprises three injections, the first two three weeks apart, and the final dose at least after two months. Doubts have been cast over the efficacy of the vaccine, with modern jabs apparently 40% effective against milder infections. Pfizer claims 80% efficacy, but some experts say their data is based on limited number of cases. Still, the head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, said the move was necessary. That's the news. Thanks for watching.